Euromax highlights coming up in today's show. Adventures in architecture, the daring constructions of Rem Kohlhaas. From coal to culture, a new generation brings cultural rejuvenation to the Ruhr. And snack on a track, a restaurant in Hamburg delivers food by roller coaster. Euromax highlights, and here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Hi there, and welcome to our Highlights Edition. Well, he's already long since won the prestigious Pritzker Prize for Architecture and made Time Magazine's list of the world's most influential people. Dutch architect Rem Kohlhaas has always pushed the limits within his own field, and as a result, his influence is vast. Well, now he's been awarded a Golden Lion for Lifetime Achievement from the Architecture Biennale in Venice. And here's a look back at some of the major landmarks in a career that's not about to slow down. Ren Kohlhaas is working on a new idea. He's planning to rebuild an entire area of Hong Kong and equip it with a host of cultural facilities. Kohlhaas, an architect and marathon runner, is involved in projects all over the world. Always on the move, he rarely has time to spend at his homes in London or Rotterdam. In Hong Kong, he is planning a waterside cultural quarter with a concert house, a theater, and many squares designed as public meeting places. Rem Kohlhaas has always been full of creative ideas, like the plans for a new airport in Amsterdam. And even the plans that never make it off the drawing board never fail to impress. His most spectacular project thus far is the headquarters of the largest Chinese TV broadcaster in Beijing, his angular skyscraper is 230 meters high. It was completed in 2009. The question was, should I do something nostalgic, or could we work together to create something for the future? And China's future is our future too, and therefore important. He's no stranger to futuristic buildings, as the Dutch embassy that was completed in Berlin in 2003 goes to show. The project won a number of awards. Although he had to adhere to strict construction regulations, Rem Kohlhaas created an architectural milestone, which critics described as modernism recreated. On the whole, I'd say architects have a lot of freedom and yet little. In Berlin, for example, I clearly had little elbow room because I had to work within the regulations. But we discovered that even within these regulations, there's still a lot of freedom. In 2003, the German capital thanked him for his contribution to the city in a major show of his work. It included the designs for the Prada shops he built in New York and Los Angeles in 2001. Fashion and architecture, Rem Kohlhaas is quite comfortable blurring lines. There are so many definitions about us that I prefer not to use them. Things are always changing. In 2005, he turned his hand to music and created this concert hall building in the Portuguese city of Porto. The Casa da Musica is a glass and concrete construction that stands in stark contrast to the buildings in the old town, a modern building which is not cut off from its surroundings, but which lets them in through its windows. In 2006, he revealed the results of a commission by the Serpentine Gallery in London's Hyde Park, a temporary pavilion like the ones designed in the past by other great architects, such as Zaha Hadid and Daniel Liebeskind. Rem Kohlhaas's design was another surprise, the first floating building in the world. He's one of the most influential architects working today, and one of the things about devising a program of exhibitions is you think about uh, artists who have to be seen. The balloon-like construction weighs three tons and is made of lightweight, translucent material. The balloon contains 6,000 cubic meters of helium. But despite its vast scale, Rem Kohlhaas was undaunted by the project. 
it's really wonderful to be something to do something that uh, disappears because people are making uh, much less demands of it uh, it becomes less uh, kind of moral issue uh, and you can therefore experiment much more yeah, it's more like a sketch or or like a theater the architect is already hard at work on his next ambitious project in Rotterdam, which, in terms of surface area, will be the largest building in the Netherlands. Rem Koolhaas, an architect with a playful approach to reinventing the world. Well, speaking of playful, how about a new concept for dining that might just remind you of an amusement park? No need to worry about forgetful waiters at a brand new restaurant in Hamburg. The Schwerelos and Zeitlos has done away with them almost entirely, and instead your food arrives in a jiffy by roller coaster. Our reporter Matthias Stamm took a chance and placed an order. This inland harbour is one of the more secluded parts of the port of Hamburg. Goods shipped to Hamburg from around the world were once stored in red brick warehouses like these. Our reporter Matthias Stamm explains. Up until a couple of years ago, this was a store for palm oil. But today, the building is the address here in Hamburg for those in search of a unique restaurant experience. And why is that? Let's see and take a look inside. Many of the old buildings here have been renovated in recent years and are now being used in innovative ways, like the Schwerelos und Zeitlos restaurant. Instead of waiters delivering food to the tables, this restaurant has a roller coaster track. The small pots and bottles hurtle to the customers over more than 400 meters. Matthias meets the restaurant's owner, Christian Steinbach. He already runs another restaurant in Hamburg and invested around a million euros in this new venture. How did you get the idea to open a restaurant where the food comes to the table on a kind of roller coaster? I first came upon the idea in Nuremberg in 2008 and I thought this is my concept for a new restaurant. I wanted to get this great patent and bring this great idea to Hamburg. So how does it work? Every table has a monitor. You activate it with a card and place your orders with it. Matthias selects his seat number and flips through the digital menu. It's easy to use, but how quickly does the food arrive? While Matthias waits for his meal, one pot after another arrives at the surrounding tables. The restaurant seats more than 200 guests and eventually hopes to be able to accommodate 1,000 visitors a day. The meals begin their journey in an elevator. They rise five meters almost to the ceiling. The rest is down to gravity. Guests can rotate the counter to reach their orders. And the food is quick to arrive. Our reporter waited just eight minutes. Well, it takes some strength and some time to get used to the way the food is served in here. But, um, okay, the dishes have to be like that, otherwise they wouldn't fit on the tracks. And the arrangements on the plate is something every guest does by himself. The culinary concept is German food with a modern twist. The monitor in the kitchen displays all the new orders. More than four kilometers of cable were laid throughout the restaurant. The chefs had to carry out extensive tests to figure out how to get the food to the table safely. We put salads or individual components on little skewers or arrange them in the pots in such a way that they'd arrive at the guests' tables, the way we wanted them to. We had trouble with soups, that wasn't easy, but now we're good at it. Each track can transport up to 17 meals per minute. With 17 tracks, that means around 270 pots could be whipping through the restaurant at any given time. How often does it happen that drinks and food fall out of the tracks and hit guests at their heads? Luckily, we had a three-week test phase to try everything out. It was chaos at first. We had schnitzel on people's shirts and cucumber soup doing somersaults. We sure learned from the experience. That was the point of the exercise. Now everything works fine. We definitely did our homework. But even a restaurant with a roller coaster can't do without waiters entirely. 
Hot drinks and cocktails arrive the good old-fashioned way. It's nice to have a waiter, but it's fun to come here once or twice a month. It's great fun. You wonder, will it work or go off the rails? It's something different. It's exciting to see the food arrive. I really feel like being in a factory in here because of all those metal tracks around me. And those metal tracks really are an amazing way to transport food in a restaurant. I haven't seen anything like this before. And uh, there's one unanswered question yet because I haven't tasted any of the food yet. And I'm going to change that right now. The portions of rolled beef are a bit smaller than Matthias is used to. This way they can fit into the pot but they taste just as good, even if they do take a rather unusual journey to the table. Well, an unusual place to live was what motivated Sascha Ackermann in northern Germany to build his own digs. And as a furniture designer, he had a good head start when it came to working with different materials. For his ideal home, he dug deep down into his box of childhood dreams, and now he's captain of his very own quiet vessel. Since early July 2010, this conservation area on the Hunter River on the outskirts of Oldenburg in northern Germany has become a home to a real showstopper of a house. A house boat, to be precise. Hello, Hello and welcome to my houseboat. In 2008, furniture designer Sascha Ackermann decided to tackle his first architectural project. This houseboat is a dream come true. I've had to forfeit some creature comforts, but out here on the water, there are other factors that matter more. Take the weather. You can enjoy it here on a houseboat more than in a city apartment with a balcony. It's open and surrounded by nature. The open plan kitchen and living room are on the first floor. The bedroom on the second. The houseboat boasts 45 square meters of living space. I've planned the house so that two people could live here, but in the long run, it's small, and you have to get along very well indeed if you're not going to get on each other's nerves. Sascha built the houseboat in just three months with the help of friends and a few reference books. After a lot of red tape, he secured a permit to anchor his houseboat in the conservation area. The houseboat is built mainly of wood. Thanks to a special coating, it's also environmentally friendly. The facade is sealed with an aluminum granulate that reflects the sun in the summer. And in the winter, it reflects the heat coming from inside, and that regulates the temperature nicely. A wood stove is used to heat the houseboat, and adding to its green credentials, it has its very own wastewater system located just a few meters away on land. Sasha Ackermann designed and made most of the furniture himself. I wanted to create my own kind of luxury with a top quality interior design. The basic idea was to keep it light, to make the room look bigger and more spacious. It's fairly minimalistic, a bit purist, so it's not too overbearing. The space gets to speak for itself. Sasha always wanted to live in the great outdoors. When I saw the birth for the first time, I knew it was perfect. 
It was a long struggle to get the houseboat here, but I managed, and I love this spot, and I hope I can live here as long as possible. These days, Sascha Ackermann gets regular inquiries from people who'd like him to build their furniture, and perhaps a houseboat too. Well, for 11 months of the year, the Scottish capital, Edinburgh, is a fairly quiet city with a modest population. But every August, that changes as the city is inundated by culture-loving tourists who come to take in a whole wealth of festivals, the most famous of which is, of course, the famous Fringe Festival. And if you can find somewhere to stay, that's a great time for a visit. Young artists from around the world promote their shows, which can be seen at more than 250 venues in Edinburgh. In August, the Royal Mile, the high street in the city's medieval old town, belongs to dancers, musicians and actors. They come hoping to be discovered. The Edinburgh Festival Fringe, usually just called the Fringe, is also regularly attended by talent scouts and producers. There's no selection process. Anyone can take part, and everyone who does dreams of making it big. Try and succeed. <laughs> it's a really good place to put on new theatre and when you want to try new things. Modernity meets tradition. Edinburgh is a city of contrasts. For more than 300 years, men here have been sporting kilts as everyday wear. Only a few metres from the hustle and bustle of the festival, you can get a tailor-made kilt but it won't be a cheap souvenir. A complete outfit can cost about 1,300 euros. Kilts became a lot more popular in the last, probably the last 10, 15 years. It's became a lot more fashionable as well. So as well as being you know, a very traditional garment, there's a lot more people now wearing it. This is the most formal uh, outfit you can wear with a black tie. It's the you know, Scottish tuxedo outfit, basically. Back to the fringe. Participants use every available space to display their talents. Undeniable, incontrovertible evidence. Most performers fund their shows themselves. It cost us every penny. Every penny. We made to get here. But it's well worthwhile. We love the fringe. There's so many people here. It's very nice to come and represent Australia and and show everyone what we can do. We accredit arts industry professionals for all over the world, and they're all coming here to discover the next big thing. And careers are made in Edinburgh every single year, and so that's an environment that's very good for an artist. Walk around me, great boys the festival and takes place in one of Europe's most beautiful oh. historical settings. At its centre, Edinburgh Castle, the city's oldest building. Below it lies the 200-year-old New Town, with parks lining its main thoroughfare, Prince's Street. Because of its centuries-old architecture, Edinburgh is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's also a UNESCO City of Literature. Edinburgh has a long history and plenty of stories to tell. Numerous novels have brought the city world renown. At every turn, you'll encounter places associated with literary greats. A number of monuments commemorate the greatest Scottish writers, among them Sir Walter Scott. The castle high up on a volcanic crag and the old town with its houses on the ridge running down from it have inspired many a writer. J.K. Rowling created Harry Potter here. Because of the atmosphere, the many layers of the city, um, even in medieval, late medieval times, about the 15th century, there were 10-storey buildings that people lived in and, in fact, still live in. And the buildings would be very high up and they go right down into the underground and into cellars and sub-cellars. So there's a whole metaphor there for, um, you know, for the id and the ego and the superego and all these. It's, it's such a, a given for us all. That it's, it's a, you just walk about and find inspiration everywhere. And the centuries-old buildings and fascinating stories inspire not just writers, but all kinds of artists. I'm here for the festival. I'm here doing a show, um, and this is just my free time. Um, that's what I've decided to do. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's, it's a good way to um, remember the city as well. You get souvenirs to take home, which is nice. As night falls, the Royal Mile slowly empties. Some festival goers are taking a break in one of the many pubs. 
In the meantime, the entertainment goes on in theatres, tents and parks. With more than 2,000 shows, the fringe artists will keep their hold on Edinburgh until the end of the month. Well, from sunny Scotland back to Germany and the Ruhr Valley, over five million people live in what was once this country's industrial heartland. Today, the heavy industry has by and large disappeared there, and the area has enjoyed a remarkable cultural renaissance. Many of those contributing to it are the children of immigrants who once came in search of work. Ricardo Doppio's parents came from Italy, and now he's doing his bit to shape the Ruhr cultural scene as a singer. As a child, the Gelsenkirchen I moved to was grey and grim. But as time went by, I got to know and love the people, and they became the light on the dark horizon of the Ruhr region. They're what make it special. Ricardo Doppio's music awakens desire for amore, and La Bella Italia. But however romantic his music, Ricardo sees himself as a local lad from Gelsenkirchen. And that's not such a far cry from Italy as you might think. The Napoli ice cream parlor is one of his favorite haunts. When we first came to Germany, it was the summer of 1974, and this is where we youngsters would come to buy ice cream. And then one day I discovered the jukebox. You have to remember that we didn't have a stereo at home, so I would ask my mother for 10 pfennigs. I'd buy an ice cream and put my coins in the jukebox. In the jukebox reingeworfen und hab immer there was a certain song I really wanted to learn, and that was Elvis Presley's Devil in Disguise. I'd listen to it, go home, practice the chorus, and then go back and listen to it again until I knew it off by heart. These days, the jukebox has gone and been replaced by a gambling machine. As soon as they'd settled in Germany, Ricardo and his eight siblings founded an Italian church choir. He was the choir master. He has happy memories of growing up in Gelsenkirchen. Our old house. That was my sister's room. All of them. That was the living room. And that was my parents' bedroom. Ricardo Doppio was born in Italy in 1965. His father was a farm laborer. He didn't see how he could provide for his family in impoverished Sardinia, so he went to Germany. He found a job on his second day there and began working as a coal miner in Meurs. His family joined him in Germany several years later. Those were tough times. I hardly ever saw my father. For many years, he worked double shifts. He was the only breadwinner for a family with nine children. So I can understand why. Coal mining is backbreaking work. I think I would have probably ended up doing it too if I hadn't had another option. But my father made sure my life was easier than his was and I didn't have to. At the end of the day, I think that is what he'd have wanted. These days, his sister Sandra lives on a workers' estate in Gelsenkirchen. Here, there are regular family get-togethers. After his father retired, Ricardo's parents moved back to Sardinia, but the family is still very close. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> My father always hoped that I would become a doctor, but ever since I was six years old and I first picked up a guitar, it was obvious what I would do. 
My guitar is like a part of me. It's a part of my life and my soul. Ricardo Doppio has already made three albums and given many concerts, a career any father would be proud of. And that's all for this edition of our Euromax highlights. So I hope you enjoyed it. And until we meet again, all the best from Berlin. And thanks for watching. Ciao and bye-bye.